And we are in 1 Samuel chapter 13, book, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, expository preaching is our diet here. Open your Bibles, 1 Samuel chapter 13. I'll have the verses on the screen. If you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles in the back. Take one. It's our gift to you. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 13, looking at 14 verses. That's it. Very important uh, in the life of Samuel and Saul, the first king. And then we'll jump into the rest of the chapter in all of 14, I believe, or most of 14 next week. So children, you're dismissed for Children's Church. And while we jump into 1 Samuel chapter 13, and what I've been doing, and I'm going to continue to do, is as we go through this chapter, I'm going to read the word to you before each point, three points today, and then I'll read from the holy text uh, in chapter 13 of 1 Samuel. So keep your Bibles open to that. So let me bring everybody up to speed. The past couple of chapters, we're witnessing something very important going on in the transition in the life of the people of Israel. They're transitioning from a period of when the, the book of Judges closes, where God raised up Judges and to lead Israel. The close in that book is closing, and a new book is opening, Samuel, where God's people go from a theocracy, a people ruled under uh, and governed by God, theocracy, to a monarchy, where God's people now are ruled and governed by an earthly king. That doesn't mean up to now that God didn't have his man or in some time, judge, in the book of Judges, his woman to help lead Israel. God had his judges, God had Abraham, God had Moses, God had men to lead. But now, God's people are under an earthly king. And his name is Saul. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. And as we get into the text, we're going to see the, the king Saul actually slowly, we'll see some of it today, uh, just kind of spiral out of control. And we call it the fall of Saul. But that's if I say that. Too fast, too many times, I'm really going to be a mess. But So the fall of Saul. So a couple of things as we look at the life of King Saul over the next couple of weeks, a couple of things I want us to remember. Number one, remember that the move from a theocracy governed by God to a monarchy was not only permitted by God, allowed by God, but God had given Israel the job description of what the king is supposed to look like, what the king is supposed to do, so that when it was time to have a king, they would know who the man is to be. They were given the orders back in Deuteronomy before they even got to the promised land, that they would pick the right guy. And in Deuteronomy chapter 17, this king in which they ought to ask for, it's very clear, he will sit on the throne of Israel, he will write for himself in a book, a copy of the law. He will have the law of God that's been approved by the Levitical priests. The priest will approve the book, the law, and give it to the king. The king will have it. He will read it all the days of his life. He will learn from reading it to fear the Lord, to keep his words, to keep his law, to keep his statutes, and do them. His heart will not be lifted up against his brothers. There will be no pride. And he should not turn to the side, one side or to the left or to the right, of the commandments so that he may continue long, the king may continue long in his kingdom, both he and his children in Israel. That's the king that you need. We know that Saul was anointed king and he was given the kingly duty to go and attack the enemies of God. Chapter 9, verse 16, God told Samuel, go anoint Saul the king, for he shall save my people from the hand of the enemies called the Philistines. And what we have seen over and over, that the king that is supposed to rule and reign in Israel is not to be a rogue king on his own. That king, again, was supposed to submit to God. He, he's submitting to God's word through the prophet Samuel over and over again. Keep the law, study the law, do the law. First point. Second thing that I want us to see before we jump into the text is what did Israel do? Israel was given the job description. They said, we want our own king. We want a king like all the other nations. We want a king that will judge us. We want a king that will fight our battles. We want our own king. And God says that's really a rejection of him. That that's idolatry. That their decision and their desire and motivation for a king did not line up with the job description. They wanted their own king. We wanted the one we want. Number three, keep in mind this. And we'll see this as Saul slowly fades out. 
Culturally speaking, things are very different, obviously. First Samuel is written many, many years ago. Very, things are very different culturally. The cultural context is very different than the context today. But the human heart hasn't changed. See, a heart that has not been renewed by the grace of God, empowered by the Spirit of God through the gospel, it knows only one thing, and that's bondage to sin. So as we see this disastrous downward spiral of King Saul, we may feel bad. I was talking to somebody between the services. But he's responsible. The same thing that could be said of Judas, the betrayer of Jesus. Part of that was a fulfillment of Scripture, but yet Judas is still responsible. He remains responsible. Lastly, remember how we ended two weeks ago. We ended with 1 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. King Saul is at the height of his career. He's the first king of Israel. The transition has taken place. He wins a decisive battle against the Ammonites. He does so, remember, with the prophet on his side. you got the king fighting the battles. you got the prophet speaking the word of God. And they go into the battle. And even after they win the battle, Saul is like, God gave us the victory. Like, yes, Saul. i got the prophet. I'm the king. I've been anointed. God gets the victory. God gets the glory, chapter 11, verse 13. And then chapter 12 ends, if you remember, Samuel calls everybody together at Gilgal. And he rebukes Israel for their silly decision and their bad attitude or their bad decision making. Wanting a king for the wrong reasons. He, he warns them of, of what's going to happen. And then he says at the end of chapter 12, look there with me, chapter 12, verse 24. He gives them two things. He says, only fear the Lord... And serve him faithfully. You've won against the Ammonites. But listen, I'm warning you. The king that you want, the kind of king you guys are asking for, is going to go bad for you. But, by God's grace, fear the Lord. Verse 24. Serve him faithfully with your whole heart. Consider the great things he's done for you. And then look how the chapter ends. But, if you still do wickedly, you wanted that king, your own king, the king that you wanted. If you still want to continue doing wickedly, you shall be swept away. Both you, both you and your king. That's how chapter 12 ends. A lot going on. Hopefully I can pull it all together in three very simple outlines. One, the performance of Jonathan. We're going to see Jonathan fight a battle of Philistines, the first battle against the Philistines in the book of Samuel. Next, the panic of Israel. Israel is going to be afraid of what is in front of them. And then finally, the punishment of King Saul. Paul, uh, excuse me, Saul will be punished for his disobedience. And then, of course, we'll end with the gospel. So look with me, if you can, the performance of Jonathan. Now, verse 1, depending on your translation, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. That's what we give out in the, there's some of the good translations out there. We use ESV. It says this in ESV, chapter 1, chapter 13, verse 1. Saul lived for one year and then became king, and when he had reigned for two years over Israel. Okay? Verse 1 is a textual nightmare for scholars. The verse follows the regular protocol used in the Old Testament and many of the kings of Israel and Judah by inserting the chronological note containing the king's age, uh, at the time of his ascension of, to the throne, the duration of his kingdom. A lot of the kings open up with that, and that's what we have here. But the question is, if you have a New American Standard or you have an NIV, it says this. Saul was 30 years old when he became king and reigned over Israel, 42 years. Well, that's very different than what I just read. If you have a King James Bible or a New King James Bible, it says Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel. Well, wait a minute. The literal Hebrew text says a son of a year. And when it says a son of a year, it usually means his age. So commentators are like, all right, well, we know Saul wasn't a year old. He's going to battle. He has a son. You know what I mean? He's, a, he's older man. So why do the translators translate this? Partly it's because Paul will say in Acts that Saul reigned over 42 years, over Israel for 42 years. So they insert what Paul said in Acts, and they bring it to the Old Testament, and they stick it right in chapter 13, verse 1, because it's ambiguous. Others leave it believe that it's been it's ambiguous it's on purpose because the author who wrote it on the inspiration of, of of the holy spirit 
wasn't sure at the time he wrote it, so it doesn't really, we don't have the specifics. It wasn't known to them. Some be people believe that maybe one, uh, uh, one number got dropped from the text when it was copied. They're not really sure. Yet I think it's very possible, and some commentators fall on this one, is that the one year is a reference of the time he was anointed privately until he actually became king in Israel. It was a year. And now he's in his second year as reign of Israel, and which we see in verse 14, the kingdom is already going to be taken from him. So one year he's been reigning, and he's in his second year, you're going to lose your kingdom. More, uh, one commentator remarked how this formula is just as defective as the king is himself. Now, as I said to the first service, if all of you don't really care about verse 1, I say I'm sorry. We took that bunny trail. I apologize. But there's some of you that were like, whoa, that's not what it said. And I would lose you for 20 minutes because you're like looking through your Bible. He said that. So for those of you who appreciate that, you're welcome. Okay? So now we can move on. Paul, excuse me, Saul is the king, chapter 13, verse 2. Saul chose 3,000 men of Israel, 2,000 in Mishmash. He's in the hill country of Bethel, and 1,000 with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent home, you can go home to your land, go home to your place, and go home to your tent. You see that? Now remember, back in chapter 10, Samuel anoints king Saul with oil. The Lord anoints him with the Holy Spirit, and Samuel tells Saul, listen, there's a garrison, there's an army of Philistines at Gibeah. When the Spirit of the Lord rushes upon you at Gibeah, and you turn into another man, the Spirit's upon you, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. In other words, you're going where you live, the Spirit of God's coming upon you, there's an enemy right at your store. Remember, you're the king. You fight enemies. That's what kings do. Get them. And we read back in chapter 10 that it never happened. King Saul does not fight the Philistines. In fact, up to right now, Saul has never fought the Philistines. In chapter 11, Saul fights his first battle, and it's the Ammonites. They're to the east of Israel. The Philistines are to the west of Israel, two armies on both sides. But things change. Look at verse 3. Jonathan defeated the garrisons of the Philistines that were in Geba, and the Philistines heard it. The rest of the Philistines heard it. But Saul, the king, blew the trumpet throughout all the land. Let the Hebrews hear this. We've won. And all Israel heard it and said that Saul had defeated the garrisons at the Philist at Philistines, uh, the garrisons of the Philistines. And also that Israel had become, listen, a stench to the Philistines. And the people were called together to join Saul where? At Gilgal. They fought, they won at Gilgal. And now the Philistines, they're not happy. They mustered a fight again against Israel. Now they got 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and troops like the sand on the seashore. In multitude. Sounds like the same promise given to Abraham. Now, they're in Geba. Jonathan defeats them at Geba. Geba is either Gibeah, just a different name in the Hebrew, or it's very close to Gibeah, now, which is near Mishmash. I'm going to show you a map. Some of you can't be able to read it all. I'm going to try to explain it to you quickly. You have the back of your Bibles. You can look it up when you get home. I just want to give you some of the land layouts. So, I, I couldn't get anything more clear, but I'll try to explain everything to you. Okay, this is Israel. You can see the red dot. Here's the Dead Sea. Here's the Sea of Galilee. Dead Sea, Sea of Galilee. Here is the area, this red box is what's going on right now. Here is Gibeah, where uh, uh, Saul was supposed to fight the Philistines, which he never did. Here is Mishmash. Bethel, so everything right inside this box pretty much is what the fighting is going on. The Philistines, right, on the west, the Ammonites on this side, and Gilgal, this is important, is right there in the center. So kind of in the center between the battles going on. You've got the Philistines on that side, you've got that, uh, the other army on this side. Gilgal is kind of in between one of the safest places you could be. That's where Saul is going to go. So he's going to go from Mishmash in here where the armies are now fighting, and he's going to go to Gilgal. Okay? And the reason why I tell you all that is because not only is it close, but 
the army, the Philistines, going to actually encamp where Saul was before he went to Gilgal. If he had stayed there, who knows what might have happened. But he flees, he goes because Samuel tells him to go to Gilgal. Now, maybe it's, maybe it's a year and a half later. Maybe, maybe it's a year, maybe it's two years after Saul was anointed and said, go fight the Philistines. But now we read in our text that it's not Saul at Gibeah or Geba fighting the Philistines. It's Jonathan. And the question becomes... Why Jonathan? He launches this successful attack against the Philistines. Why Jonathan and not Saul? Well, I mentioned a few weeks ago that when you read a historical narrative in the Old Testament, sometimes you get just the facts, what's happening. You don't get the why. Why did Jonathan move ahead and fight? Why was Saul not there? We don't really know. Some people think that Jonathan wanted to be a, a stud, this, this young Buck looking to, uh, you know, kind of goes off half cocked and he's just going to fight the Philistines who are pressing in on them. And by the way, for a spoiler alert, we don't know this, Jonathan is Saul's son. King Saul has a son and his name is Jonathan. And this is that Jonathan. We'll learn more about him later. But Jonathan is fighting, and some people say, you know what, he's just trying to prove something. Some people say, you know what, it was a stupid decision because he fights the Philistines. They get angry, now they come back with a multitude that nobody could number. He should have just left them alone. Some people say that his father never gave him permission, but we know from the text, his father's really, really happy. He's going around blowing the trumpet, and he gets all the credit, so he's got the spin doctor going on, right? He's the one that holds the press conferences, and they're like, Saul, you did a great job. What's happening, though, and you will see this as the weeks go on, is Jonathan and Saul, between Jonathan and Saul, there's a major contrast. Jonathan, as we will see in weeks to come, is known for his deep love, his, his loyal friendship to David, his faith in God. While Saul, his father, is repeatedly shown to be foolish, prideful, and disobedience. And this contrast between father and son begins right here. Let's make something relevant. Let, let's draw out a principle for us to take home today. Here's the principle we could take from this. When we engage the enemy, as Jonathan did, by faith, we are to expect a pushback. When we engage the enemy by faith, expect a pushback. Remember we said in chapter 12, we see all this bloody wars going on in the Old Testament. And we should remind us that the gospel is a war. Not with guns and not with bombs and not with, with flesh and bones, but we're in a spiritual war. Right? Our warfare have divine power to destroy strongholds and, and destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And we are to take what? Every thought. That's where the battle is right there. Captive to the obedience to Christ. We have weapons that are called righteousness. We have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The scripture says that we ought to put on the whole armor of God so that we could stand against the schemes of the devil. We have an enemy. And we're going to have pushback when we are walking faithfully. A couple things to consider as we consider an enemy. I'm going to mention a few things you can talk about in your community groups this week. If you don't have a community group to talk in, talk to, then sign up for one. But the rest of you in a community group, talk about the enemy. A couple of things we want, to, we want to remember. Number one, we're to know our enemy. Right? In order to defeat your enemy, you must know your enemy without knowledge of who your enemy is. You're walking into a battle blindly. It's good to have knowledge and not walk into something blindly. The better you know your enemy, you know the weapons they will use. You will know the will and the, and the things in which he does. The scripture says that we have an enemy. He's, his name is Satan. He has demons. The emissary is called demons. He is not omnipotent. God is all-powerful. He is not omniscient. He's not all-knowing. He is not omnipresent. He is not everywhere. Only God are those things. But he's a created being, and our fight is a spiritual battle. Paul says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces of evil. And Paul says that God has given us armor to put on as a people. So I'm here to tell you this morning that ultimately it's not the politicians that's your enemy. 
It's not that neighbor that absolutely drives you crazy. There are people created in the Imago Dei with dignity, value, and worth, and they've been taken captive by the enemy, and they are in urgent need of rescue of the gospel. Love them. Know your enemy. Number two, know that he is a schemer. He's called that we are not to be unaware of his schemes. We are to know his tactics. There, he's a cunning creature who loves to, to, to find people's weaknesses and exploit them. My weaknesses and exploit me. The Bible calls Satan a liar, a deceiver, a thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. An accuser. His voice condemns. His voice accuses. He, he's always pushing blame and fear and shame. He disguised himself, the scripture says, as an angel of light. Oh, isn't that lovely? He's a tempter. He draws away people from the truth of God's word and the gospel. We shouldn't be fooled. He'll use false doctrine to get people away from the truth. Know your enemy. Know that he is, he, he, we shouldn't be unaware of his schemes. Number three, the primary weapon that the enemy uses is deception. It's deception. He promotes, uh, 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 he wants us to not believe on the truth. I think it was Neil Anderson who said, it's not a power encounter, it's a truth encounter. He, he's no match for our creator, but if he can deceive. Peter said this, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in your faith. In other words, Satan's primary weapon is deceit, and therefore prepare our minds for action. We are to focus on this truth of God's word, reading the scripture, resting in the scriptures, believing God's promises, resting in his love and sovereignty. Jesus said, if you abide in my word, if you abide in my word, you will know the truth, and that truth will set you free. Jesus said in John 17, and he prays for his followers, sanctify them, what? In the truth for thy Word is truth. Ephesians 6, 14, stand firm, having fastened on the belt of truth. That's where the battleground is. And that's why Paul says, listen, it's not against flesh and blood. Flesh and blood. It's against divine powers. And that we destroy the arguments that are going on in our head. And lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God by how? Taking every thought captive to the obedience to Christ. Is what I'm thinking truth? He's a deceiver. Know your enemy. Know he's a schemer. Know the truth. And finally and lastly, and this is like a more of a, a think this through. It's good to know him. It's good to know the way he operates. It's good to know his schemes. But listen. Know your enemy. But know your Savior better. Know your enemy. But know the gospel better. Bang the gospel. Preach the gospel to yourself every single day. First John, little children, you are from God and have overcome them, the Antichrist, the enemy. For God who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. So, family, as long as the Israelites were passive and not accomplishing much, the Philistines were left alone. As soon as the Israels attacked they became, what does it say, a stench to the enemy. So let me ask the question. We asked in the first service. Are you, am I, a stench to the enemy? Are you living for Christ so courageously and completely that you are a stench to Satan and his forces? As long as we live passively and we're not standing in the truth, as long as we're not growing in, in the gospel, I don't really care. But once we start growing in the gospel, once we start influencing people with the gospel, once we start loving people and stepping out in faith, and once we start not only declaring the gospel in truth, but demonstrating the gospel in love, we become a stench. So, never heard this before, one of your objectives as a Christian is to be a stench. You're welcome. You're supposed to smell real bad to the enemy. The performance, look at the panic, look what happens. The Philistines mustered a fight with Israel. They're not happy. 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, sand of the seashore. They came up and encamped in Mishmash. That's where Saul was. Now he's in Gilgal, to the east of Beth Haven. 
And when the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, for the people were hard-pressed, they hid themselves. They're running in caves, jumping in holes, hiding in rocks, behind rocks. They're in the tombs, cisterns, those things that hold water. And some Hebrews crossed the fords, crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Man, they are fleeing. Saul was still at Gilgal, and all the people followed him, trembling. Fear had come into the camp. They're overtaken by fear. The overwhelming force of the Philistines, the, the, super, the superiority of them, both in, in their weapons and their equipment, and, and, and everyone's running. Yeah, they encamped right where Saul was. Saul leaves, and the Philistines take over where Saul was. Sometimes we lose ground. Sometimes, sometimes we're growing in certain areas in our life and we're gaining and we're walking and we're, and we're, 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 we're taking uh, uh, forces down. And then sometimes this ugly habit comes back. And we find ourselves struggling with old habits. A book written a long time ago by Chuck Swindoll, Three Steps Forward, Two Steps Back. That's life sometimes, isn't it? We just hope it's not two steps forward and three steps back, right? Because you're always moving forward. At least you gained one foot, right? Sometimes we get knocked back. And the important thing is that we need to keep making progress. Keep trusting in the gospel. And here are some folks. They're intimidated. They're running. They're hiding. Some are going to Gad and Gilead. That's across the Jor um, what they call the Transjordan region by the Sea of Galilee and the, and the Dead Sea. They're crossing over. Saul's at Gilgal. Saul is at the place in the middle of the state, in the middle of the nation. He's somewhat safe for the moment. It's the same place. It comes very important in the life of Israel. It's the same place where Israel had first crossed the promised land. It's the place where they had renewed covenant. It's a place where Samuel had renewed the covenant. Gilgal is a very safe place that has, brings back all kinds of memories of the covenant-making God. That's where he is. More importantly... He's there because Samuel told him to go there. Samuel told him in chapter 10 that he needs to go there and wait there for seven days. Some people think, you know what? He said, go and wait there once you beat the Philistines. He had, didn't do it for two years, and now he's responding. After two years, he's going to Gilgal and waiting for Samuel for seven days. I think he was told that a couple of years ago. He never went, and he was told somehow along the way. Samuel at some point got word to Saul after this battle, get to Gilgal. I'll be there. You go as the prophet is speaking. God is saying, go to Gilgal, wait for me seven days. Either way, Samuel's told, go to Gilgal, wait there for the prophet. Wait till the prophet. Now we remember, Samuel told him, the king and to everyone, what you ought to do, remember, blessings and curse, remember, fear God and obey and serve him. Fear God and obey and serve him. What do we have here going on? We have the people of God fearing the enemy. We have the people of God running away from the place God had put them. They are taking off. And Saul staying put for the moment, but he's losing support. People are afraid and they're running all over the place. And people are in fear. But the Bible says that we are to fear God more than we are to fear our enemies. And remember, there's a difference between negative fear, which is terrorizing you, the negative fear is that terrorizing fear of what someone's going to harm you versus the godly fear that's an awe, that's a reverence of respect when you embrace the gospel. When you come to understand the love and grace of God and you realize it's not about what you do, it's not about your work, it's not about your deeds, it's not about your morality, it's about Christ's perfect life, his work on the cross, his deeds, his forgiveness for you. That kind of fear produces joy, awe, wonder before the majesty and the greatness of all that God is and all that God is doing. So my question for us this morning is, why do we fear others with a terrorizing fear and not fear and reverence God? Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever been terrorized by fear? Or maybe what other people say. A simple answer that can be found in 1 John. 1 John chapter 4 verse 18 says this. There is no fear in love. But perfect love 
cast out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fear has not been perfected in love. Perfected, brought to completion, come to an end, to be finished. John is saying that that kind of perfected love is done by abiding in God who is love. A love that escapes the day of judgment. A love that escapes punishment because Jesus Christ on the cross takes all our punishment apart for our sins upon the tree. And therefore, Romans 8 says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no judgment, condemnation for those who are in Christ just Jesus because Christ accomplishes that for us. And, and, and the Bible says the kind of love that God loves us is the kind of love that he has love for his son. Do you remember that in John 15? As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. And Jesus is saying the eternal love of the Father who loves the Son eternally and perfectly and without measure, complete in all its love, is the same kind of love that he has for his children. That we stand in that love, that eternal, unfading, without measure, without modification, that continual love of God. It's not simply God loves you. It's God loves you with the love he has for his son and his son has for the father. That's the kind of love that God's love has for you as children of God. That's amazing. That's the antidote to the problems of fear. God's love, when it governs our hearts, will produce fearlessness. So what are we afraid of? Are we, are we coming to know and trust and love God? Are we allowing his love to be poured out in us? You see, a spirit of fear, uh, fearfulness and timidity doesn't come from God. And we overcome by trusting and loving God. And the key to overcoming fear is total trust and complete trust in the God who loves you. And that's not what Israel was doing. Israel wasn't trusting God. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego were brought into that fiery furnace, you remember? And they overcame their fear because they trusted God. Stephen, who stood fearlessly before his killers in Acts 7, trusted in God. Even in the darkest times, we can trust in God knowing that he is good. Once we've learned to put our trust in God, once we understand his love for us, it will dissipate fear. And we will say, as the psalmist says in Psalm 51, Let all who take refuge in you, O Lord, rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them that those who love your name will exult in you. So why were the people afraid of the Philistines? They failed to trust God's kind providence. The way in which he's working all things out. Why were they afraid of the Philistines? Because they were failed to trust his good provision. God had fought many battles for them. Why were they people afraid of the Philistines? They failed to trust his providence, his provision, and his great love for them. And they fled. And although Saul is hanging in there, he does become afraid. And actually, he'll be called a fool. Look at the punishment of Saul, chapter 13, verse 8. Therefore, he says, he, Saul, waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. Samuel didn't come to Gilgal. And the people were scattering Verse 9, Paul said, bring the burnt offering. I know I'm supposed to wait, but bring the offering to me, both, the, both the, the burnt and the peace offering. And he offered the burnt offerings. As soon as he finished the offering of the burnt offering, the first one, behold, Samuel came. Don't you just hate that? Samuel went out to meet him and greet him. Remember, he's the tallest, handsome guy in all of Israel, we learned. Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, well, uh, I, I saw the people were scattering from me. Uh, they did not want, you know, you didn't come on the appointed day. And the Philistines had mustered up an army at Mishmash. I said, now the Philistines are going to come down to me at Gilgal. And I, I, I had to seek favor of the Lord, verse 12. So I forced myself, I love that, and offered the burnt offering. And what am I supposed to do? Samuel said to Saul, huh, you've done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. So he gets through six days. He's on the seventh day. It's probably a night time because he sacrificed morning and night. He wasted a seventh day, and you could just hear the king, right? Because all of us self-talk, let's be honest. If, you, if you're going back and forth having a conversation, we should talk. But most people just talk to themselves, and you can hear King Saul. Where is that old guy? Right? 
I mean, how long does he want me to wait? The man's on the seventh day. Does he know? Does he know? Uh, uh, does he know about the army? Does he know what's going on? I mean, where is he? He said wait seven days. The sun's going down. Where is this guy? He's got ten minutes. You know? All right, ten more minutes. But if he's not here, and you can see, he's waiting. He's waiting. And he's waiting. Where is this guy? People start to scatter. The little army he had, he has even less. The enemy's pressing in, and he takes matters into his own hands, and he's like, all right, give me the sacrifices. I'll do it myself. Why does God make us wait? Why does God make us wait? Maybe it's because he wants us to grow in our faith. Maybe he wants us to learn to trust him. Maybe, maybe, there's something going on in the universe he's working out other than you. I know that may be shocking. Like, really, there's something more important than me right now, Lord? Maybe, just maybe. Faith says God is sovereign and God is good. I could trust him with the details of my life. Saul offers up the first sacrifice, and Saul shows up. Uh, uh, Samuel shows up. And Samuel goes out to greet him. Uh, Saul goes out to greet him, excuse me. Samuel shows up. Saul goes out to greet him. Before he can say anything, he says, what have you done? What have you done? God said the same thing to Eve. What have you done? God said the same thing to Cain when he killed his brother. What have you done? God said the same thing to Achan when he stole that stuff from Jericho. What have you done? The answer is supposed to be, I've sinned. Opportunity to confess my sin, repent of my sin. Instead of confessing, Saul chooses to blame everybody, right? He, 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 I, got, I got excuses, Samuel. I got excuses. Family, he fails to take responsibility. Saul fails to take responsibility for disobeying God. Rather than that, I've got excuses. He's got four of them. Look at the first one. It was the troops' fault, bunch of cowards. They're running all over the place. What am I supposed to do? Blame them. Number two, why are you late? It's your fault, Samuel. If you had been here on time, like you said, it's already getting dark. It's your fault. Number three, did you see the size of that army? They're coming around. I, 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 what was I supposed to do? It's the army's fault. It's the Philistines. It's my army. It's their army. It's your fault. I love the last one. I was seeking favor of God. It's his fault. I mean, he's between a rock and a hard place. I get it. As I said earlier, he should have done like Hannah did. What did Hannah do? Hannah just sought the law through prayer. Don't, don't, break the, the, don't obstruct the prerogatives that were given to the prophet alone. You do do what the prophet tells you to do. And I love this one. He was forced. I was forced to do it. Listen, we're never forced to sin. Right? Come on. We could be tempted, and temptation could be strong. But we're never compelled to sin in the sense where we are now Forced to do it. Samuel's not buying it, man. He's not buying what King sell, selling, and he judges the action as a fool. A fool does not mean intellectually stupid. There's some very bright people who are foolish. The Bible says a fool says in his heart there is no God. There are atheists who are very smart. A fool in Scripture is one who denies God, one who denies his word, the one who doesn't seek his face. That's a fool. Saul, the first king of Israel, placed himself as the authority over God's word instead of making God's word his authority. I read a story this week about James VI of Scotland. He was a king, and he was notoriously rude. A king that's rude. And when a preacher would come in, his name is Robert Bruce, would preach, he would come in and he would preach, and the king would come into the, to the auditorium there, into the, the place where the preaching was going on, and he would run his mouth with all his little puppets he had. And as soon as he began to preach, the king would talk. So the preacher just stopped and looked up at the king. The king looked down at the preacher. And it was quiet. The preacher got up there and started preaching. Robert Bruce started preaching the gospel. And the king started talking and running his mouth again. So the preacher stopped. Second time, looked up at the king like, really? And the king looked down at the preacher and kept his mouth shut. Also, the preacher started preaching a third time. And the king is running his mouth again. And finally, Bruce paused place becomes silent. And he looked up at the king and he said this. It is said to have been an expression of the wisest kings that when the lion roars, all the beasts of the field are quiet. 
The lion of the tribe of Judah is now roaring in the voice of his gospel. And it becomes all the petty kings of the earth to be silent. End quote. Kings easily forget they are subjects to the king of kings. They ignore the king's decree, either blatantly obnoxious or subtly quiet like Saul. Listen, everyone to whom much is given, much is required. Saul was given a kingdom, and he failed. And Saul viewed the sacrifices of God as vital, as as absolutely essential, but the word of God, the prophetic direction of God, expandable. But you know what the scripture says, to obey is better than sacrifice. The king is not free to go wherever he wants, do whatever he wants, and fight whoever he wants. The king is supposed to submit to the word of God through the prophet of God and do the battle that God has told him to do. Saul failed to do that. Saul did not do that. He did not sit and submit himself to a higher authority. It's not so much that he offered the sacrifice because David does it and so does Solomon and they're not reprimanded. Why the criticism? Saul's offense is not the mere fact that he offered a sacrifice. Listen, he disobeyed the word of God. He, he took the initiative and did what he wanted to do. Verse 13, and Samuel said to him, you've done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God. You have not kept the man, Lord God, for the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now, not now. Your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man of his own heart, after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be the prince over his people. Because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Wait seven days until the prophet comes and gives you direction. Over and over and over so far we have seen that the prophet of God, Samuel, is trying, trying to teach Saul. Samuel is trying to teach Saul. Samuel is trying to teach God's people. Samuel is trying to teach us today. We are to hear and respond to King Jesus. See, the monarchy of Israel was supposed to be under the king, the king of kings. Not under the nations that come over the king. This was to be under the king. And same with us this morning. Same with us this morning. Our priority, our first line of, 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 of uh, allegiance, and I'm a pro, I, 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 mean, I love where I live. I'm a patriotic guy. But my first allegiance is to King Jesus, not to New York State and not to America. I know that's not popular today. And I'm not saying be patriotic. And I love those who serve our military. And I love those who serve in politics. We need good, godly people there. But my allegiance, first and foremost, is to King Jesus. Because America is not going to be around someday. Jesus is going to come back, and I said this before, you're not going to have a vote. Voting booths are closed. Samuel is trying to teach Saul, first and foremost, God. God is king over Israel. God is king over America. Therefore, his failure... And his punishment, as he pursues independence in his own actions, become his disqualification. You're done. You're done. It is equivalent of rebelling against the Lord. You will no longer, your dynasty will no longer last forever. Look at his punishment, number one. He says he would establish your kingdom, but now he's not going to. You were going to have a kingdom for all time, but now that is over, he says. Now that is over. Number two, look what it says. Not only your dynasty, not only your, your children, not only will it pass down and you will have an everlasting kingdom. Look at number two. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be the prince of Israel. Who's that man? King David. Unlike Saul, this new leader will be a man according to God's heart, according to God's desire, according to God's will. The new king will, will genuinely act in accordance with God's wishes in a way that Saul does not. In fact, both kings, King Saul and King David, is said to be chosen by God. But the circumstances are radically different. The one chosen, Saul, chosen by God is because of judgment against Israel. But David is chosen on the basis of divine criterion, free from human demands. But let's, say, let's be honest, we'll see this. David, King David, the beloved king of Israel, will sin. He will sin greatly. He'll be involved in adultery and murder. Why? Because the king of kings, and the one who really will be after God's own heart, his name is Jesus Christ. He is the true king. He is the true and better king who will obey the Father completely. He will be completely, totally 
totally a man after God's own heart. He will only do what the Father tells him. He will only, he will only say what the Father tells him to say. All of these kings point to Jesus Christ, to the promise of King Jesus. The one promised not only to King David, not only to Abraham, but the king that was promised will come. And God speaks in the midst of sin and, and pride and rebellion. That promise was made in the Garden of Eden back in Genesis 3. Family, when you go home and read this text again, look at the parallels between Adam in the garden and Saul in Israel. There's a parallel between these two men. In fact, both men are representatives of their prospective social institution. Adam over humanity, Saul over Israel. Both violate the commands given to them by the Lord. Both men express an unwillingness to take personal responsibility for their actions. Adam was told, don't eat from the tree of the garden. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat or you will die. And he sins and rebels. What does he do? Lord, that, that lady you gave me. You know, that woman. She was hot and beautiful. I was singing over a minute ago. But now I'm blaming her because she's the one that gave me that fruit. Or how about this one, God? You gave her to me. You know that lady that you made for me? Yeah, it's her fault. Or it's your fault, but it's certainly not my fault. And because of Adam's disobedience to God... He lost the opportunity for eternal life in the garden. He was booted. And because of Saul's disobedience to God, he lost the opportunity for an enduring dynasty in the promised land. Now, these parallels are not accidental. It's consistent biblical position that view the loss of position, privilege, and the presence of God is expected when you violate the Lord's commands. We see it all throughout the text. We see it in chapter 12. There's curses and blessings. Follow, obey, walk with me, do as I say, you'll be blessed. Rebel, sin, do whatever you want, and there's curses. Curses and blessings. They're very real, and they're very permanent. So what do we need? Listen, family, we need someone to not only obey the Lord completely and fully, and therefore he's not even subject to the curses of God, but we need someone who can remove the curses of God that are on all of us because all have sinned, rebelled, and lost position, privilege, in the presence of God. That's what we need. You see, Adam was placed in the garden as our representative. Adam was told not to eat of the tree of life, and if he obeyed God, he would live, but if he disobeys God, he will die. In other words, obey me and I'll bless you. Disobey sin, lose position, privilege, and presence. King Saul, you're given a kingdom. Representing Israel in the promised land. Obey me and I'll establish a kingdom forever. In other words, obey me and I will bless you. But disobey me, sin, you will lose your position, privilege, and presence of God. And now God sends us a second Adam. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the head of the new covenant. He's the head and representative. And he hears another command. Jesus Christ is sent by the Father to go to the cross. And for the first time in history, the first and only time in history, the Father says, obey me and you will be cursed. Obey me and you will be bring a curse. If you obey me, if you're faithful to me, if, if you do all those things, I will forsake you. I will cast you off. You will lose your position, privilege, and presence of God. And Jesus on the cross cries out what? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The first time ever in the ministry of Jesus where he calls out to his father and he uses the term God. No more father. He calls out God. First and only time that loss of intimacy, the loss of position, privilege, and the presence of God as God turns his face away from him as he absorbs the sin of of the world. Dr. Keller says this. To the first Adam, God said, obey me about the tree and I will bless you. And Adam didn't do it. But to the second Adam, Jesus Christ, he says, obey me about the tree and I will crush you. And Jesus does. Listen to Galatians. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. The virgin birth. Born under the law. Why? To redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoptions as sons and daughters. For all who rely on the work of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law. That's you and me. But Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. 
You see, family? Jesus Christ is the true and better king. He obeys the Father perfectly, lived the perfect life that we could not live. He dies the death on a cross and takes our curse for us. Dies the penalty for us. Dies and absorbs the wrath for us. And the more you see that, the more you treasure that, the more you believe that, the more you preach that to yourself, the greater, the greater your love will grow. And fear will dissipate. The greater the enemy will have to flee because you become a stench to that enemy, trusting in the goodness of God. The greater you understand that, the greater you will trust God because he loves you with an eternal love through the cross of Jesus Christ. What do you fear this morning? What are you trusting in this morning? What are you believing on this morning? Jesus Christ calls us to believe on him, the one who took the curse for us, the one who took the punishment for us, to turn from our sins, turn from being our own Savior and Lord, and turn and trust in Jesus Christ, and invite him into your life and receive the gift of faith and salvation. Let us pray. Lord, we are going to respond now. With a song that tells us that we don't come to you by our own deeds. Trying to earn our own favor. Something that Jesus Christ has already done. Help us, Lord, to sing these words and mean these words. We're going to sing that uh, we can go astray. We battle needless fears. Voices condemn us. But, Lord, you draw us homeward. That we may trust in Jesus who bore every sin. I want to cling to Christ. It's more than we can do, and we know that, so we are holding on. But, Lord, we know ultimately you are holding on to us. Thank you, Lord. We pray that as we respond and sing, we respond in faith. In Jesus' name.